really. But here it's not that way. So I really appreciate that very much. I want to give you an illustration tonight of uh, one of the ways the devil works in a supernatural sense. Uh, when he says, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, rules, or darkness in high places, uh, people get this misconception that you would uh, definitely know or understand when the devil shows up. Uh, but you don't always see him. He is, uh, can appear, as I've showed you before, as an angel of light. I've showed you before that his ministers are ministers of righteousness. And so uh, being aware of that, as we started off this morning in Sunday school, for those of you that were able to be here, we talked about him being a roaring lion, walking about, seeking, looking for who he may devour. Now I'll give you an illustration of that here in Acts chapter number 8, along with a couple other things. And after you're seated, I'm going to take you to Revelation 16, and I'm going to show you something there. Look in verse 5, 8, 5 to start with. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's a good thing, wouldn't you agree? Amen. I mean, that's what we do when we go out on the street. We don't go out and preach about all the other stuff. We go out on the street and we preach Jesus Christ and Amen. Him crucified. All right, and the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Well, look who shows up. Verse 7. When preaching is going on, unclean spirits are there. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many of those who possessed, were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame and healed, and there was great joy in that city. Can you find for me in those four uh, verses that I gave you there, can you find for me speaking in tongues? There we go, sir. That's it. It's not there at all. Brother Roger, back in the back, you pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I will draw your attention now to a couple more verses before we go to Revelation 16, and then we're going to come back. Look in verse number 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, before time of the same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that him, himself was some great one, of whom they all gave heed, the least to the greatest, saying, This man is a great power of who? Can I ask you a question? Do you think God would use sorcery? Do you think God would use bewitching? But you know what the people think when they see it? They think it's God. Look in verse number 11. And to him they had, re, uh, had regard because of her long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now the thing I want to remind you about here before we go any further is, is that just because somebody does something supernatural doesn't mean that that's of God. Just because you hear somebody, Ostula, Shantai, Untai, Bowtie, Economy, Honda, however you want to say it, and I am mocking or making fun of it, it doesn't mean God's in the thing at all. Just because somebody says to you, well, I spoke with another tongue. Okay, well, good. We'll pray for you to get a bridle for the one you have. But in the meantime, just because they did that and had a supernatural experience, it doesn't mean it was God that did that. Take your Bible, leave your finger right there in Acts chapter number 8. We're going to come back. Look, if you will, with me over to Revelation chapter 16. Now, during the tribulation period, you're going to see this stuff show up. You say, why? Because in the tribulation period, it'll all be based on sight, and it'll be based on sound, and it'll be based on them being able to see what's going on in a supernatural sense. So all of a sudden, people are looking for signs, wonders, and miracles. I told you that this morning. Now, it's not an attempt to upset somebody or to frustrate somebody. Every time this subject comes up, somebody gets in a snit. They get mad. They get upset about it because they go by experience instead of by fact. I'm not questioning that you may have had an experience. I'm telling you that that experience may not have been of God. If you're going to go by what the Bible says, you have to recognize that you might have been utilized by the devil to try to convince you contrary to Scripture. Isn't that what the devil does? That starts in Genesis chapter number 3. In Genesis chapter number 3, if you'll remember the passage, you know what happens when Eve's talking to him? The devil responds with, Yea, if God said... 
Now, when you talk this way, the problem is, is that, well, I was there, I saw it. I was there, I experienced. I was there, I felt it. That doesn't mean anything at all. It means, was God in it? Was it done the right way? This morning, if you were here for Sunday school, I went very briefly. I showed you that if you were going to speak in tongues, first of all, it was a language. Second of all, it would be by course. That means three. And that means one witness, one talking, and one interpreting. And it looks as if the witness and the interpreter are there to justify each other. The individual may not even know what he's saying. And it's done for the benefit of the propagation of the gospel or to confirm the word that's being preached to who? To who? Jews and unbelievers, right? Everywhere time where tongue shows up, it's unbelievers and it's Jewish in context. I said that not long ago and an individual said, that's not true. Cornelius wasn't a Jew. There wasn't an unbelieving Jew present uh, there at all. Yes, there was. Peter was there. Peter's the unbeliever Jew in Acts chapter number 10. Peter didn't believe it had gone to the Gentile. You know how he showed it had gone to the Gentile? He's got a Gentile speaking in a Hebrew tongue. Yeah. Peter said, how do you know Hebrew, man? You're not a Hebrew. You don't know the Jewish tongue. How do you know Hebrew? The guy says, I don't know how I know it. I just know that's what I, I was just told to say. And the Lord said, hey, Peter, don't you call unclean what I've called clean. Yeah. I told you I'm done with the Jew. I'm moving over here. I'm fixing to call Acts chapter number 9. I've already called the Apostle Paul out. And now Acts chapter number 10, Cornelius, who was a Gentile, is getting in. Now you have to recognize that, ladies and gentlemen. And if you don't, you've got to go by facts. You can't go by feelings. You want to be very careful, especially when it comes to this realm. Ouija boards and with all the stuff that's out there now about seances and, and all this that people think is funny. It's not funny and you're opening up another realm, another world that's a real world. You're dumping those things and hordes coming out into this world and it's not even the tribulation yet. Those things are dangerous to fool around with them. They crawl all over you like fleas get on a dog. And you say, well, what do I do? You plead the blood and you don't open the gates and you make them feel unwelcome. What makes them feel unwelcome? Uh, two girls up here singing, a young lady playing the piano. You know, are you weary? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. That sounds so corny. That sounds so corny. You think to yourself, well, that ain't, I mean, man, come on, get, get something going, man. What's that? You know what that is? It's like styrofoam lives that are demons in here. It irritates the hound out of them, man. Y'all get up here and you're singing, you know, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the symbol of suffering and shame, and, I, and all that. You're singing that, and you're thinking to yourself, man, what a drag, what a drag. You're singing, my anchor holds, my anchor holds, man. And that kind of, the demons in here are crawling. They're thinking, man, would you shut up? Would you shut up? But your flesh is thinking, man, what, what is that? It's spiritual. That's what it is. You have to be careful with that stuff. You say what? Those demonic things, those entities, they ride that stuff. And you have to be real careful about it. I'll show you it's in a political realm. You may not believe this. You think you hear these people speaking and giving these speeches? There's been some great presidents and some great uh, statesmen and things that have gotten up giving speeches. And you can't help but be moved by the way those speeches come across. They're great orators. Where does that come from? It's supernatural. You say, who, who, who empowers them? The God of this world empowers them. You don't believe me. You're thinking, oh, no, preacher, they're just very well practiced. Uh-uh. I'm telling you right now that the uh, Lord allows the devil to have power over those entities, and they're able to come out there. And you know what they do? They'll fool you. They'll trick you. You'll throw facts in the garbage can. Happens right here in Duval County. You hear what you think you want to hear. You say what? Your ears have had a, 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 a little uh, a piece of um, filter put across them by the devil, and you hear what the devil wants you to hear. You don't hear what's really true. And the next thing, you're just enamored by how somebody speaks, but he just sounds so nice. Nice. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. That sounds so positive. Yes, we can. You ever listen to the cadence of that man speak? It's supernatural. You're a fool if you don't think that guy can talk. Man, he can speak, man. I mean, he can move entire audiences and people. He's not a preacher that you would call a preacher, but he's preacher of his own gospel. You want to hear a real preacher? You go back and you pull some of the archives of Adolf Hitler talking or Garin talking. 
man, I'm going to tell you what, it'll make your stinking skin stand up on edge. I mean, you'll get chicken skin, even though that guy was demonically possessed and went over there with the spear of destiny and sat in uh, chambers over there in the pyramids where uh, Napoleon was and had meetings over there with supernatural things. How does he move an entire nation to do what he wound up doing like the Antichrist will be? The power of the tongue. You say, what? Is it? It's demonic. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have to pay attention to who you listen to. Why? Faith cometh by hearing. and hearing by. All right, if that's the case, then the devil's going to counterfeit it. Watch this thing in Revelation chapter number 16. You say, you're trying to scare me? Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what I'm trying to do. Sure, I'm trying to scare you. I'm trying to make you aware of it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to tell you everything you listen to shouldn't be listened to. You say, what? It'll fool you. All right, Revelation 16, notice what happens. The fifth angel, verse number 10, poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness. Imagine that. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores. Look at this. This is amazing to me. And repented not of their deeds. <laughs> wow, that's a clue, man. You got sores, you got pain, you got difficulty and you're blaspheming the one that sent it instead of saying, I'm sorry, forgive me. Verse number 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up. The way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's called the king's highway. It's another message there. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's your satanic uh, trinity right there. For they are the spirits of what? Devils. Doing what? Well, how about that? You think your preacher's off his rocker. Oh, preacher, come on. No, they're working miracles. Which, the, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle in the great day of God Almighty. Now, you know what he said? Those unclean spirits get into the uh, people that are in charge during the tribulation, the kings of the earth, and those kings of the earth have the power to be able to encourage people to come to the Valley of Megiddo where the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought and encourages them to come against God Almighty. Would you agree that's some pretty powerful words? Uh, words are pretty powerful things, ladies and gentlemen, especially words when you happen to be under uh, demonic influence. And I'm not just talking about in a guttural tone and saying some kind of satanic stuff. Uh, it's not how the devil talks. The devil's a seducer. The devil knows how to talk. The devil knows when to talk. The devil knows smooth things, easy things. The devil knows how to put you sound asleep. He knows how to, how to be able to get you, uh, get you sidetracked. All right, come back to Acts chapter 8. Let me point out just a couple of things here. Now, you know in the Bible, and it's in the Old Testament, it's all through Deuteronomy, you're not to have anything to do with astrology and with necromancy and, and with those kind of things. You say, well, preacher, you know, I read my horoscope. I wouldn't read my horoscope on a bet. You say, well, you know what they do. I know what they do. They put them all in a bowl and pick them out and post them up there, and then you wound up posting them. But you're participating in something that God doesn't want you to participate in. That don't mean you can't crack open the fortune cookie and read the numbers on the back of it. Just don't play the lottery. <laughs> What's your foreign? 13, 12, 24, and 22, you know? They always say something stupid on the other side, like, you sure are good looking, and you were until you ate this cookie, and now you're fat, you know, or something <laughs> like that. But ladies and gentlemen, it's the mindset that you have. It's fooling around with things where the Lord like necromancy. That's talking to the dead. They make movies about that. They had television shows about that where people are communicating with your dead loved ones. You can't communicate with dead loved ones. You're talking to demons. You're talking to devils. Why would you want to talk to them anyway? Maybe now that they're dead, they're glad not to have to talk to you anymore. <laughs> And now you come down there and, you know, you, you try, you think, oh, what is that? How did that person know this? And how did that? Because the demons have been here. Yeah. They've studied that whole thing. You know what he says? Stay away from it. I wouldn't even turn the channel on on your TV. He said, well, it's just kind of interesting stuff. What are you so interested in knowing the future for? Amen. I can tell you what the future is. Amen. I can tell you exactly what it is. Right. You, you want to know what it is? What's well, in the book? It's not all about when's it going to happen to you. It's nothing about knowing what particular numbers are. All right, look at this thing now in Acts chapter number 8 here. Notice in verse number 9, uh, this individual here is inflated with pride, and he has disciples, he has followers, and uh, some are well known. 
This guy's not a crackpot. Thank you, sir. This guy's not a crackpot. He's not a nut job. The mistaken thing is, is you think you're going to look and find the maniac of the Gadara, a naked man running around here cutting himself, fetters and chains hanging off of him with long hair, slobbering all over himself. Not this guy, man. He's been following one around and had three cases for years and years and years. And people follow him up. You know what they think? He's a man of God. He's a man of God. He's a man of God. How else can you explain all these people that are on television nowadays and they have all these great multitudes of followers and you know them and you recognize them? How is it that even even though they have been exposed, they keep following tens of thousands of people and people keep following them week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out, and you expose them and nothing happens to them. Why? People honestly believe they're of God. You say, well, preacher, they've done some great and mighty things. So did he did. The same thing you're reading about right now. When this Simon the sorcerer showed up, he had great abilities. He was a counterfeiter. He was able to mimic what they were doing. Verse number 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And don't jump to conclusions now. You say, what happens? Well, if you can't beat them, join them. What's he doing? He's getting in with the right crowd, the right place, because you know what I got to do? I got to, I got to do something. These guys are upstaging me. They got real power. He knows he doesn't have the power. These guys have something. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go along. Why? It's to my advantage. By the way, it is to your advantage to get saved, but it's not to your advantage to just join up because you think it'll give you power or prestige or preeminence. Years ago, and most of you wouldn't know this, you older people would know this and understand it, but people, especially in the South, they'd come into a new town or a new city or something, and they'd find out whatever church was most known in the political realm and in the business realm, and they would join those churches just for the benefit to their business. I mean, who could help, who could benefit their jewelry business or who could benefit whatever else it might be? Because that's how it was. Do you realize it used to be on your banking application for money? On your banking applications, what church were you affiliated with or what church did you join? Now, I'm talking 50s and 60s and just the smidgen of the 70s there. And they would ask you what church. You wouldn't even think about asking somebody that now. You say religious discrimination. But you know what they did? Back in the day, they considered you to be a person of character if you went to church. Even if you were lost as a golf ball in high weeds. A lot of those people back then were lost. You know what they thought? They thought they were saved because they went to church. You know, when they'd be in church, every time the doors were open. Those old farmers and those old businessmen and stuff, they'd pile the church full. Never trusted Jesus Christ. Go to revival once or twice a year. Have all day sings and all day eating on the ground and things like that. And come to church and think, well, you know, I guess I'm saved. Are you saved? Sure, I'm saved. I go to church. Uh, back in the old days in the Southern Baptist churches, when you walked down the aisle, they baptized you and you were saved. That's, they figured you were saved. They didn't ask you if you were saved. They asked you to want to join the church. Now, I'm not making fun. I'm just simply saying, look, I was a Southern Baptist since nine months before I was born. My dad didn't preach that. But the majority of Southern Baptists would have you come down. And when you came down here, you came down for only two reasons. You came down twice in your life. Once you came down to join the church and get baptized, and it's almost like they baptized you into the church, not after the salvation. And the second one, you rededicate your life, oftentimes one time a year when they had a special meeting. Now, every church is not like that, and a lot of other preachers weren't that way. And please don't take offense and miss the rest of the message now because you've been out of shape. Well, my pastor wasn't that way. Okay, all right, you're an exception to the rule. I'm telling you, historically, people joined the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, and the Baptists, forget all the other spinoffs, Pentecostals and all that other, forget those, those four main things. If you were in their church, you were considered saved. All you were was a church member. Your name was on a roll. Uh, how many of you remember that you had to sign a church covenant in those days? Anybody? There's only three or four of you, maybe five of you. You know what you had to do when you got ready to join the church? You had to agree to whatever the covenant was. I won't go to movies and I won't wear shorts and I, I won't do this and I won't do that and so on and so forth. And you signed your name like pinning the tail on the donkey. And that must mean that you're a, that you're a saved individual. There's nothing in that, co that covenant that said, I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and asked Him to forgive me of my sins. And I claimed Him as my personal personal saviors, nothing in there. It's just now that I'm a member of such and such a church, I promise not to do the following things. That's not just the United States of America. That's orthodoxy. That happened over there where we were uh, overseas in Romania. You sign a covenant. 
Hey, are you saved? Well, they didn't know if you were saved or not. Most of them were, uh, were Calvinists. All right, now notice this guy has a certain amount of influence, but then the next thing you know what he says, look in verse number 19 what he's after. Give me also this what? He wants the power. The only reason he wants to do something is, is because he wants that uh, supernatural touch. Take your Bible, look in John chapter 2. Leave your finger right where it is. John chapter number 2. Now, this individual here definitely has the power. And uh, the devil is uh, showed up here because Philip's preaching and God's getting something done. In uh, Acts chapter number 16, when they get the Macedonian call, uh, Paul and Silas go over there and they get ready to preach. And every time they get ready to preach, a woman with a spirit of divination shows up and she amens the apostle when he's up there when he's praying and talking to the Lord. Every time he gets ready to talk, that, that uh, lady comes in there and guess what? She is agreeing in a positive way. She's not disagreeing. She's not arguing. She's just interrupting the prayer. Amen, Paul. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's right. Yeah, amen. That's right. That's right. You know, amen, Paul. You're right there with it. To the point that Paul finally says, would you please hush? I mean, now's not the time for you to be amen. And you say, what was it? It was a spirit of divination. Not one time did she contradict anything he said. It was just an interruption. You have to be careful when God gets to doing something. Now, I'm going to say something here, and I don't intend to offend, but it's going to offend. Uh, we had a lady, it's happened here on more than one occasion, it's happened a couple times over here, but we had a lady came here, and I'm sure that she meant well. I'm sure she did the way that she would normally do things, but she walked in here to a church service, and we were having, for us, a pretty good church service. I mean, church was going pretty good, you know, and folks were getting a little excited, a little bit like it got this morning, got a little shouting going on, a little, you know, you know a little pep in our step, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, she just gets up and spouts off a whole bunch of things. She didn't have any idea what she said. But the timing of the thing, it literally is like all of a sudden you just ran into a brick wall. It's like, what in the world just happened there? The timing was completely out of place. Everything had died down and it got quiet. And then she jumped up and spouted off some things that she said. I couldn't tell you what they were. And I responded with, uh, Sister, we don't do that around here and I'll do the preaching. Thank you. And uh, she did manage to stay for the rest of the service. And some people got upset because I said something to her. No, she was wrong. This is, this is a Baptist church, but more than that, we're a Bible-believing church. And you don't come in here and stump up and just because everybody, well, you know, my auntie does it. I don't care. My grandma did it. I don't care. It's not right. It's not just a woman thing. It's speaking in tongues for this age is out of place. Amen. Now, here's what happens. The timing has to be paid attention to. Amen. You say, well, but preacher, I don't know that I would have called her down and that kind of a thing. Okay, well, when you get your own church, you can do what you want. But what I'm trying to do is prevent something from taking a foothold. Yes. I'm not talking to the woman. I'm talking to what's in her that would Amen. cause her to get up to Amen. do that. That's not that woman. It's a spirit that's there. Amen. And you say, what'd you do? I corrected it. And then she sat down. Now here's what you don't know. She came up a little later and I said, Sister, there's plenty of churches around here that believe that stuff. And if that's what you want to do, you can have at it. If you want to come here, you can't do that here. Amen. You say, well, I thought everybody was welcome. You're not welcome here if you're going to disrupt the service. It causes confusion. The Bible teaches you that the devil is the author of confusion. God has order. Things are to be done decently and in order. That's found in 1 Corinthians 14. I showed it to you this morning. So the thing you want to recognize here, like in Acts 16, is Philip's getting something done, and guess who shows up? Now, you've got to be aware that when you start living right, doing right, reading your Bible and praying and getting up and trying to do, yes, what's going to happen? The devil will show up in your household just as sure as I'm standing here. And if you're on the way to work and instead of talking on the telephone and listening to the beatbox and so on and so forth, you're praying and talking to the Lord and listening to the right kind of stuff, you'll step out. And as soon as you walk into your office, there'll be a demon waiting on you to get there. And guess what's going to happen? Man, he'll be done knocked all the papers off the desk. He's got something to say to you. Your boss is going to be in an objective case and the kick it and move, winged at a dill pickle time and picked at crab apple time. I mean, in face so long, he'd ice cream out of a butter churn. And he comes there and confronts you say, man, and what in the world's going on? It's the devil. Amen. You see, you're trying to tell me there's a devil behind every bush. No, but every other bush. 
You say, why? Whenever you start moving toward the Lord, you can look for opposition. We wrestle. Wrestle's not, you're not punching. Wrestling is you're grappling. You're holding on. He's holding on to you. You're holding on to him. It's a continual thing. And you have to recognize that. Some of you have asked me, well, preacher, I started reading my Bible and praying, and I started trying to do things the Lord wants me to do, and I'm passing out some tracts, and I'm doing some things along the way, and man, preacher, I'm just having nothing but opposition. Why is that? You got somebody's attention now. You want a, a great way to stir up trouble. Your marriage running a little dry, is it? <laughs> and kind of, you know, just kind of the routine, the mundane, and that kind of a deal. You me tell you how to put a little excitement in your marriage? I can tell you how, not the way you're even thinking. <laughs> we'll go out and have a candlelit dinner and have a steak dinner and all that other kind of, bah, save your money, man. <laughs> I can tell you how to really spice it up. You say, how? Oh, do something for the Lord. Read your Bible and pray and pass out a track. Ma'am, you think that old goat that you're married to, he doesn't pay no attention to you? You want to get his attention? Do something for the Lord. When you come in, he'll give you your attention. You say, why? That old devil in him will be stirred up. And the next thing you know, boy, it'll be fireworks like the 4th of July going off in the middle of your house. So you say, man, what is going on? It's the devil. You have flat tires on a 747. Yeah, just a coincidence. Sure it is. Sure it is. Delays and stuff. No, you're trying to do something for the Lord. Now, if you recognize that, you almost get a kind of a laugh out of it. It kind of gets to be sort of funny. And now all of a sudden I'm trying to get to a meeting and I'm in a traffic jam. <laughs> and you're thinking, I got a good excuse to be late for work now. I'm in a traffic jam. <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. All I did was pray and read my Bible this morning. And somebody comes by and waves at you funny and honks the horn at you and stuff like that. And if you could just peel their face back, you know what you'd see? You'd see a demonic entity right there. You say, why? Because the devil's got your number. Now, I know what I'm talking about. I may not know a lot about a lot of things, but I know something about this. And if you're going to do your best to try to live for the Lord, you know what you're going to have? You're not going to go through it scot-free. You get saved and start living for the Lord. That's why some of you got saved and you went to church and you never did anything. And now all of a sudden you're trying to do a little something for the Lord and you can't believe. That's why people don't want to do anything for the Lord because when you start, trouble starts. You say, why? You're stirring up the hordes of hell. That's why. And they're mad at you. All right, John chapter number 2. Have you found that? Look, if you will, verse number, oh, let's see, 23. John chapter number 2 and verse number 23. Hey, Philip, how are you doing? And the Bible says this, Now when he was at Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast of the day, many believed in his name, and when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what man he is. I'm in John chapter number 2. Now you know what happens? They're following Jesus because of miracles. Yes. All they're doing is following him because they want to see a sideshow. Right. The thing you have to be aware of, ladies and gentlemen, is, is whenever the emphasis is on miracles, it's an attempt to draw a crowd. Right. It's not to try to do anything for the Lord. That passage, come to, let's see, let me uh, think a minute here. Go to Revelation 13. Come to Revelation 13. Do you realize a third of the people that are supposedly saved today say they believe in reincarnation? That's a third. That's the latest Pew research. A third of the individuals say they believe in astrological signs, even though it's contrary to Scripture. Reincarnation. What do you think you would come back as? A unicorn? <laughs> Murphy's Law, never play leapfrog with a unicorn. <laughs> You'll get that one in a minute. Murphy's Law, the other lane always moves faster than yours. If you don't think so, go ahead and change lanes. <laughs> you know what happens, ladies and gentlemen? Individuals, they say that they're saved, and the next thing you know, they're still doing the other things that they used to do when it comes to demonic entities. They're messing around with the supernatural. You know what they say? I believe in reincarnation. You believe in reincarnation? That means when you die, you come back as something else? Well, if you believe in reincarnation, then you must believe in evolution. You'd have to. 
because you don't come back as a person when you believe in reincarnation. The Hindus believe in reincarnation, and when you come back, you come back as an animal. Can you imagine coming back? You're thinking, boy, I'm going to die. When I get back, I'm going to get elevated into a different life cycle and so on. If you come back as a cockroach, <laughs> you say, well, preacher, that would never happen to me. How do you know? You don't know. Can you imagine me doing Brother Elbert's funeral over here a couple of days ago on Wednesday, and I'm at the funeral, and I'm saying, well, I sure hope, I, hope he's going to be okay, and I hope whenever he came by, you didn't step on him on the way in when you walked in here because, you know, he was a lizard and ran under the door, and that might have been Elbert you stepped on. I got a Bible that tells me exactly what I'll be when I come up. That Bible said, I'll have a glorified body, and I'll be like Christ. That Bible even tells me how I'll think. You say, what? I'll have the mind of Christ. And you know, that Bible says my body will be a glorified body. Man, I'm going to tell you what. I mean, the Bible doesn't tell me, hey, when you, uh, you come back as a squirrel. <laughs> I used to like it. I shouldn't tell you this and all that kind of stuff. But I used to be a funny guy that was, uh, they say he was a Christian man. But he used to sing a song about a squirrel getting loose in the church. <laughs> Y'all remember that song, don't you? See, some of y'all are like, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, I bet you know the highway to hell, though, don't you? That's uh, the, that was the, the, the squirrel. What's the name of that song? You're from Alabama. You ought to know the name of that. What is that? What is the name of it? Squirrel went to church. <laughs> That's worth hearing, man. Now, that doesn't mean go listen to the, the radio for 15 hours hoping it'll play. <laughs> That, that, that squirrel goes to church and I'm thinking in my mind's eye, I've been in a church like that. Man, if the squirrel were to get loose in there, the people would be going, but I go to church with squirrels all the time. <laughs> you just don't run under the pews. <laughs> oh, boy, boy, boy. But, I, but, I, but you know what? You think about reincarnation. Now think about, think about how silly that is. Why they're over there starving to death and they won't kill a cow because they think it might be their uncle. They really believe that. They go over there and pour milk out to stone statues and they're starving to death. You know what they did? They went over there and we sent them a whole bunch of grain. We, the United States of America, through uh, UNICEF and one other group, and they sent it over there. You know what happened to that grain? That grain sat over there on their docks and it rotted because mice got in it and they wouldn't fumigate it to help the grain get to the people that are starving to death. I'm talking about picking up people in garbage trucks and dump trucks dying in the street every night from starvation. They won't fumigate it for the mice and the vermin that are down there because they're afraid they'll be killing a human being. And they let the people starve to death. That's religion for you. You say, what is that? That's demonic. Yes. Laying there starving to death. You say, well, preacher, you, you're, you're kind of frightening me just a little bit. I don't think I could frighten you enough. Amen. A matter of fact, I think if I could get you to understand this, you might recognize or realize that uh, this thing is real you're dealing with. Right. You see, it's laughable to you to think that, you know, don't, don't step on a bug. It might be your, you know, a monkey's uncle or whatever it may be, that kind of a deal. They actually believe that. Now, we know better than to believe that. Look at this thing in Revelation chapter number 13. Come down, if you will, please, in the interest of time here, come down to verse number 13. 13, 13. Those are a couple of good numbers. Now, watch what happens. The worship, the, make it 12. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth with him to dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, there's some stuff going on there with this chat bot stuff and so on and so forth. Some of it's so far over my head, I can't even, I get dizzy thinking about it. But that stuff is uh, getting uh, where it can be infused by the devil. He's able to give the image the ability to speak. You used to think that was crazy, and now you don't think anything of it. You fool around with that stuff, man, you're fooling around with another world, with other entities. If there was anything that at least would set up the mark of the beast, it'd be that stuff. That computer stuff where they're smarter than you are. Verse number 13, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of, of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. How? By means of the miracles that he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast and the wound with this, that it was, uh, had the wound by, the, by a sword and which did live and power to give li uh, life an image 
life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many that would not worship the image, the beast should be killed. You know what you got? You got an individual that's sitting up there that has the ability to uh, give power to an image and he tells everybody, fall down and worship me. And if he doesn't, he zaps them on the spot. You say, what is that? It's demonic. It's demonic powers. How did he fool them? You just read it. Signs, wonders, and miracles. You mean, preacher, we're just supposed to believe it by faith? Yes, you're just supposed to believe it by faith. Well, preacher, what's the, what's the Lord going to do for you? He's going to give you a Bible and tell you to believe what the Bible says. But ladies and gentlemen, don't be surprised and don't be dazzled by the supernatural. You say, what? It's appealing. You're going to see things happen as it gets closer and closer to coming. You're going to start recognizing things and you're going to see things and it's going to shock you. Come back to Acts chapter number 8 and let's try to hurry. You ever have somebody come up to you and say they had a dream or they had a vision? And they tell you that they're able to see into the future and those kind of things. That's a, a selfish counterfeit. That's not biblical. You know what God did? He provided for you a King James Bible and he put it in your lap. You know what he said? He said, study to show yourself approved. So much easier to take some hallucinogens, take some mushrooms or something and go to sleep at night and have a dream and then wake up and then spend all the time talking about your dream instead of reading what the Bible says and ask God to show it to you rightly divided. But wouldn't you much rather go see a sideshow? I mean, wouldn't you rather go watch a, a party go on? Wouldn't you rather see somebody supposedly get up out of a wheelchair or somebody get their spine straightened out or somebody's leg grow? That's a, a real good trick that they do nowadays. Or wouldn't you, of course, it always cost you something. That's it. Yep. Chicken buckets down there to be able to collect all the money and they're on the way to the bank like the WWF wrestlers. Right. <laughs> I know y'all think that stuff's real, but I'm just here to tell you <laughs> I've been backstage with them while they're all back there making it rain. <laughs> Some of you guys look like I just told you the truth about Santa Claus or something. <laughs> I cannot believe grown men are sitting there going, oh no, I've seen them bleed. The more scar tissue they have, the easier it is for it to bleed. Surely you know that. You say, what does that mean? That's just a trick of the trade. They wind up getting that, and the more blood you see, the more money you put in the plate. You say, what is it? Dazzled by the delusioned. What am I going to do? I'm going to wind up doing some uh, miracles and stuff. In Isaiah chapter number 14, uh, the devil winds up being a self-centered. You know what he says? I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I'll put my throne above the stars of heaven. I'm going to be God. That's what he winds up doing. Look at this boy here named Simon. Simon winds up creating some issues. Come down, if you will, verses uh, 9 and 10. I've already given you that. He says, give me the power there in verse number 14. And then watch what happens in verse number 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he did what? Well, how about that? Do you find that interesting? He said, hey, man, I'll pay whatever it costs. I just want whatever you got. Come put your paws on me. Come quickly over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This will be your last time we'll turn and then we'll stay in Acts and I'll finish that out for you. 1 Timothy 6. You see, what is this? It's a character study. So you'll recognize characters when you see them. You say, what drives those individuals? Uh, pride drives them. You heard anything about pride lately? Have y'all heard anything about pride? This side has. <laughs> You're kind of quiet there. That's the wrong kind of pride. Pride in your perversion. And you're made to feel like something is wrong with you if you're not proud for them in their perversion. Something is wrong with the system and there's something wrong, ladies and gentlemen, with you if you feel bad about not being proud of their perversion. How can you be proud about that? They're running all kind of uh, shows and stuff now and making you feel like if you're not watching the shows and you're not down with all that and doing all those kind of things, there's something wrong with you. I'm here to tell you there's something right with you. Amen. You say, what is that stuff? It's demonic. It's filthy. Amen. Well, but, but preacher, you know, now see, see, now you ain't going to move me on that one. Amen. 
And I'll tell you now, you're not going to move me on that. You say, why? It's flatly wrong. There is no, you, you, you can't cut any corners on the thing. It's just wrong. But here's the wrong. The big wrong is, is to make you feel bad that you're not proud about their perversion. Well, I refuse to be proud of your perversion. That's what you want to do. Go practice it in a corner somewhere. Don't get around me. I don't want anything to do with you. Well, that's not very Christian. You're wrong. It is Christian. Come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. What fellowship hath black, a white light with darkness and what fellowship hath Christ with Belial? You cannot have uh, the cup of devils and sit at the table of the Lord. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Okay, I choose to come out. You say, what do they need to do? They need to go back in. You'll get that in a minute. Come out of the closet. Come out of the closet. Nail the closet shut. I don't want you out of the closet. There's stuff this world nowadays talks about that even back, some of you older heads in here that are a little older than I am, you can remember the days that even though you knew it was going on, you had better sense than to talk about it. You had a bigger sense of morality than to discuss that stuff openly. Why, you didn't even discuss people having affairs and things like that. You wouldn't dare to, that stuff's all over TV nowadays. You can't flip the box on without seeing commercials and stuff. I'm going through the airport thing the other day, going to wherever we were going. And I look over on the wall going down the jetway there. And here's two guys called significant others. And they're hugged up there. On, and I'm getting on an airplane. And they're, brought, they're advertising that. You know, hey, we're for you. You say, what is that? That's demonic. It's to desensitize you. It's to make you think something's wrong with you. No, something's right with you. There's something inside you that that should just make you, that, uh, don't, that don't, um, that don't feel right. I'm real concerned about kids nowadays in school. You say, why? Because they're having that stuff shoved down their throat. And they're being made to feel like something's wrong with them. You know, the wildest thing, now I don't know, I haven't checked with our principal. The wildest thing that I've been told by a school official in Duval County is, is that you are not allowed to hand, hold hands, hug or kiss, male or female, but they wouldn't stop two homosexuals. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. You, you look shocked. Why would you be shocked about that? It's demonic. That Bible says when the Antichrist comes to, uh, to rule and to reign, you know what it says? He won't regard women. Now you just think about that for a minute. Say, so, well, maybe he's just not going to listen to women as advisors. You think that's what that is? Or do you think it might be possible he's a maphrodite? I mean, if he's filthy already, why wouldn't he be that? Isn't that your... platform right now? Yes, sir. Don't you have them dressing up nowadays and reading stories to your children? Yes, sir. Am I completely out of touch or something? Why are you looking at me like that? I'm, 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 isn't that what they're doing? Yes. The audacity of having somebody like that come into a school and sit down and read books to your kids? That doesn't, that doesn't trip your triggers? Well, I like... Well, some ain't right about that. <laughs> You're shot, man. You are shot. You know, well, preacher, that's just rounding out their education. There's some things you just don't need to be educated about. My, you can back. I don't, I can't even, I don't even understand that. Well, preacher, you're just getting old. I guess I am. I guess I am. I'm glad of it. And y'all can have it here before much longer, man. First Timothy chapter number six. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to goodness, he is, uh-huh, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, where cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil uh, surmisings, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of truth, uh, supposing that gain is godliness from such, hang out with. Because you're worried about your reputation. You realize you don't have to be a jerk, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. You don't have to be a hot dog. Right. You know what you can just say? No, thank you. Right. Not interested, thank you. Right. See you later. 
You think I'm going to say God bless you? No. I'm not going to say God bless you. You want to say God bless you, you help yourself. You must have a guilty conscience or something. All right, come back quickly to back, uh, back over here. Let me show you this thing, uh, what happens. Now you realize he showed up now and the miracles and stuff are being done. But now the miracles are getting done. Um, all of a sudden they're getting done through the power of the Holy Ghost. And he recognizes it and wants the power. We're back in Acts chapter number 8. Give me also this power, verse number 19, and whomsoever I lay hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. People say, well, Simon got saved. No, he didn't. He played the game because he was interested in getting something on the side. He wanted to get it. Look in verse number 10. They gave heed to him, the least of the greatest. This man has a great power of God. He had the sorcerer's power. He didn't have God's power on him. You know what he told them? He said, I'll tell you what I want. I'll get it. He says, now watch. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven them, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You know what he just said? Your self-promotion is going to get you killed. Gall of bitterness. That's uh, bound up with uh, iniquity. Disillusioned, unfaithful, unfulfilled, desired, frustrated ambition. Look in verse 24. Then answered Simon, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. That isn't what he asked him to pray. He said, repent. You think he's going to repent? No. You say, pray for me. That's like Bundy's confession at the end of life. Everybody is talking about Bundy. I don't know why he's so consumed with a guy that murdered, prob probably, probably killed over 300 people. You say, well, how do you know any about that stuff? We talked with his psychiatrist for over a week down in a big class that they had. We had to study that guy. You say, well, I think uh, D Brother Dobson went down there and talked to him. And, and then Dobson, you know what he was doing? He was doing anything in the world. That boy is a died in the world psychopath and would do anything in the world to preserve his own hide. His repentance didn't mean anything. He'd hang somebody up and do ungodly, unspeakable things. And the more they screamed, the more he loved that he is devil possessed and demonic. You say, well, you know, I think maybe he got saved at the end. Well, maybe he did. I guess we'll see when we get there. Here's the question for you. You honestly believed after all of those years, all of those trials, he never one time decided to get right until right at the very end. He said he might tell you where some of the bodies are if you just don't fry him. And some of you people fell for it. Well, he means business. How come you're holding the cards if you got right there, Simon the sorcerer? Why don't you go ahead and repent and say, listen, I did it and here's where the bodies are. And I got an answer to God for it. Like the boy out in Montana. He raped, and, uh, raped uh, two women, a, a woman and her daughter, and killed them both. And he got saved when he was in prison. You say, how do you know he was saved? Because of his actions. He said, what did he do? They sentenced him to death. And he said, you need to take me out and kill me because what I did is reprehensible. And I deserve to die for what I did. I've trusted Jesus Christ with my soul, but I need to pay for my life for what I did. Take me out and hang me. The AFL-CIO and one other company got together and they tried to stop the execution and he said leave my case alone I deserve to die for what I did that was Montana years ago when they used to let him swing from a rope not all jailhouse confessions are real but I think that one's probably real but but Bundy but what a what a thing man and people are saying well you know maybe eventually you had an FBI agent that went down there and spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours what else has he got to do but sit there and talk you say what should they have done they should have locked him away and let him until they get ready to fry him just let him sit down there and just rot right. Amen. see you don't know about him what I know about him some of you do but you say well but preacher that no no that's like Simon Oh, pray, pray for me that these things you said are going to happen to me. That's not real repentance. Let me ask you a question. Two kind of repentance in the Bible. Peter comes out there and the Lord looks at him. And the Bible said, and he went out and wept bitterly. Uh, and that's called godly sorrow. And Judas comes out there and the Bible says he said he was sorry and he went out and hung himself. Judas was sorry he got caught. 
All Bundy did was do his best to hold on to the last minute to do everything he could to preserve his miserable, rotten life, sitting down there until the last possible minute. And when the clock ran out and he figured, well, here's my Hail Mary. <laughs> I'm saved. Is he? I don't know if he is or not. I couldn't tell you. It's not up for me to decide. But I kind of find it hard to believe after that man did all that stuff that he did and how many times he heard that gospel preached to him and how many times until the very last second he had turned that thing down. I don't even know if he had the ability to understand what that really was. And if he really did mean business, why didn't he tell us where all the rest of the bodies are? Amen. They went to the grave with him. And people, the families still don't have closure over that stuff. You say, what do you have? I don't have any re reprehensive, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any remorse for how I feel about that at all. None. Amen. You say, what happened? We'll tell when we get there. But you know what you do? You look at Simon, you say, well, you know, preacher, he, he repented. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You know what he did? He just had the veil. You know what Paul, Pete said to him? Pete said, you're in the gall of bitterness, boy. You're in the bounds of bondage of iniquity. You say, why? You only came here for frustrated ambition. You only came here because you wanted to be a show pony. You wanted to hang out with some people and get the power. You didn't come to get saved because you're a sinner. You just wanted to get plugged into 440 so you can make more money on the side. You know what Peter said? Your money perish with you, boy. He gave him a chance to repent. Did he repent? No. Pray for me, preacher. I, I hope these things don't come true. Well, if you believed they were going to come true, you know what you'd have been? Lord, please have mercy on me. The veil's off. You know what else he should have done? I'm almost done. You know what else he should have done? He should have stepped in all them people. He had bamfoozled and all that. You know what he should have done? I'm talking about a man named uh, Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sickle mirror tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord came by and said, Hey, Zac, I'm coming to your house today. And you know what happened after he met with the Lord? He went back and he gave everybody he had swindled out of money. He gave them back fourfold. Well, if Simon really meant business, you know what he should have done? Everybody had been lying to and everybody had been cheating and everybody had been shamming. You know what he should have done? He should have held up a public uh, meeting and he said, I've been lying to every one of you and I see the real thing now and I got the real thing now and I'm going to do my best to pay you back and then some with interest what I've gotten back to you. You don't see any signs of repentance. John the Baptist gets ready to preach. I'm, I'm just giving you a character study. John the Baptist gets ready to preach and he has some people that come up there and they say, I want to repent and be baptized and so on and so forth. And uh, John the Baptist says, uh, go back and bring me meat fit for repentance. In other words, show me you really mean business. I don't believe you mean business. I think you're just here to go along with the rest of the crowd. And he called them out. Well, that ain't a way to build a church, man. <laughs> We're not glad to see you at all. Go back and bring meat fit for repentance. If you really mean business, you'll come back. And if you don't, see you later. Have a nice day. See you in the millennium. Now, what happens with Simon? He never does get right. You say, why? Because his motive was all, uh, it was all ordained by a, a sorcery, by witchcraft, by evil things. Why are you telling me that, preacher? Because everywhere God is, the devil's right there. The old preacher used to say this. I didn't realize it was this late. I'm sorry, I'm running a little behind. Um, but uh, the old preacher used to say this. He said, you want to remember something, young man? I said, yes, sir. What's that? And he said, you want to remember that the closer you get to uh, God, the closer you are to the devil. That's something to think about. And the Lord really starts moving in your life. You know what will happen? You'll start seeing conflict and things happen. And you'll start thinking and surmising that things are going on between you and other people that aren't even there. The devil's great at confusing you. I'll try to cover this stuff for you on Wednesday night, Lord willing. But you know what will happen? You'll start imagining that something's going on with somebody who otherwise is everything's fine. The next thing you know, you're thinking something's up. And then they don't like you. And then they said something about you. And, 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 and then you see them talking and you're thinking, they're talking about me. What is that? That's demonic. Anything to, dis to sow discord, you can sow discord with a look. Can't you? I mean, somebody looks at you and you. 
And you're like, what'd you look away from? Because you're ugly. <laughs> no, I'm sending you a message. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying my best to warn you in these last days that you need to be more concerned about what I'm preaching to you tonight than you need to do about a nuclear attack. Yes. There is nothing you can do about a nuclear attack. If it comes, you can go get whatever you got hidden in the basement or whatever and fire away. You ain't going to stop it if it's, if it's coming this way. But you got a thing because of the Bible and because of the blood of Jesus Christ that you have the power through those spoken words that are right there to give yourself and your family protection. Amen. And you should take advantage of it. Yes. And do not believe that you can't be deceived. That's right. Amen. All of us can be yes. deceived. Amen. And so you know what? You have to realize that what I'm telling you is the absolute truth and that in the last days, the signs and the wonders and the miracles, that's not going to dazzle you. But you know what will get you? It gets you caught up in your thought process and it gets you overthinking things and it gets you worried. Help me, Miss Barbara. And you get to thinking, what if? And maybe. And I'm not sure. And... And then before long, your anxiety is through the roof. And the Lord said, uh, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your thanksgiving be known unto God. O oh Lord, oh, whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, and whatsoever things are virtuous, and whatsoever things are... Uh, think on these things. <sighs> okay, Lord. But Lord, what about... <sighs> and the Lord said, be careful for nothing. I got it. You say, what is that? Ladies and gentlemen, some of you are not crazy. You're just under demonic influence. You got some gates open. And there ain't nothing, no pill in the world that's going to solve that much anxiety except the gospel. And you got to learn to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and recognize there's some things you can't handle. All right, we'll leave it right there and I'll give you some stuff. If you'll come back on uh, Wednesday night, I'll give you a couple of things to show you how to fight that fight there for you out of Ephesians 6 and a couple other places. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed.